Okay, let's see if I got this. Ikaka lazi krika krika kwaze kwaka waka ukokoka ikaka la kapaleka ikini la tibalika la kaula ukokoko. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Once again, this shirt was made by geography Ruba from UnityShirtsShop.com. She makes these cool handmade African flag logo shirts. Oh, and uh, she specifically made this one with the Geography Now logo in the back for me. Oh, thank you, Ruba. Oh, and don't forget, you can also get Geography Now merchandise at GeographyNow.com. Just a heads up. Anyway, South Africa. This is a big one. South Africa is kind of a big deal in Africa in general. And you know what else is a big deal? Having an actual South African in the episode. Say hi to Catherine from South Africa. Come on in. My, the, my people, they are just the best people in the world and it will always be home, yeah. no matter where I live. All right, well, you ready to get into this episode, Catherine? Yes. All right, let's do it. So South Africa has always played a historically imperative role when it came to expeditions from early traders. And you can probably guess why. For one, the country lies at the bottom of the continent of Africa, bi-coastal between the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. In fact, the southernmost point of the African continental mainland, Cape Agulhas, has a cool spot you can check out with a plaque and a giant Africa map monument. From there, they are bordered by six other countries, don't forget little Eswatini, and the entirely enclaved country of Lesotho. From there, the country is divided into nine provinces. The country doesn't have one official capital, but rather three. Victoria, which holds the executive branch, including the home of the president, as well as most of the embassies for international diplomats. The legislative branch is held in Cape Town, where you can find the national parliament and second largest city in the country. And Bloemfontein, near the center of the country, hosts the judicial branch and the Supreme Court of Appeal. Some say technically Johannesburg could also be considered maybe a fourth capital because it has the constitutional court, and the city has a huge level of significance as the largest and busiest city of the country. But eh, you decide. Johannesburg also hosts the biggest and busiest airport in South Africa, OR. Tambo International, whereas the second and third largest airports lie respectively in the second and third largest cities, Cape Town and Durban's King Shaka International. The country has a wide network of roadways and the most well-developed rail system in all of Africa. Johannesburg being the main central hub that spiderwebs all the other main lines that stretch into every other province and abroad into neighboring countries. South Africa also boasts incredible seafaring infrastructure with the second busiest container port in all of Africa after Port Said in Egypt, the port of Durban, which provides 60% of all South Africa Africa's shipping revenue. Finally, South Africa's island or insular region are mostly confined to small patches along the coasts like the Port Elizabeth Bay or Robben Island just north of Cape Town, famous for being the spot where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. However, if we include the entire domain belonging to South Africa, then Prince Edward and Marion Island, which belong to the Western Cape Province, are the actual southernmost points of the African continent. These islands are mostly uninhabited, with the exception of a meteorological station and bunkers for scientists. Yeah, and the southernmost point on Marion Island is called Cape Hooker. Literally, it is. <laughs> so, okay, you're probably wondering, why isn't the Sutu part of South Africa? Yeah, why? Hmm. Well, long story short, it was kind of like... UK! Okay, if you help me kick his ass, I'll be one of your protectorates. You got a deal. <laughs> I got him. Woo! Hey, your king died, and we want to make you a part of the Cape Colony. Oh, no, I'll just stick with protectorate. Well, we don't like that. Okay, well, I guess that means we'll spend the next 14 years resisting and giving you a headache. Deal. We give up. We'll give you guys self-rule as a separate crown colony. You guys suck, but whatever. It's better than being part of the Cape Colony. South Africa is now going to become its own country, and we want you to be in it. Oh, hell no. Oh, come on. We're going to have very tense, racially divisive apartheid policies that will disenfranchise your people. Okay, how do you see that as conducive to the benefit of my people? <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't. All right, well, enjoy your self-rule. And from there, it pretty much sealed the deal that Lesotho would never join South Africa. Anyway! Now here's the interesting thing. Even though South Africa is a republic, the constitution includes the traditional leadership clause, which recognizes the certain indigenous monarchs. Yeah, today there are about 13 monarchs from nine different ethno-linguistic groups and tons of other smaller paramounts and high chiefs in South Africa. Although they do not have direct legislative power to the republic, they have a high degree of regional influence and involvement in communal affairs. Sadly, shortly before Filming this episode, Zulu King Goodwill Zwelitini passed away. He ruled for five decades and had a huge role of significance in the Zulu community. Wow, he was a king. A king. Well, in any case, let's talk about some of the top notable spots and let's have South African influence.
influencer and travel writer Gofari do it for us. Gofari, take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Gofari, a South African travel blogger, and I'm going to talk you through the notable sites to visit in South Africa. So I'm going to talk through the cultural and the man-made sites. We have Blokrans Bridge, which is the highest bridge bungee in the world. We also have many theme parks like Gold Reef City, the Palace of the Lost City, and Ushaka Marine World. Ponte Tower, District 6 Museum, the world's largest pineapple, the Big Hole, Orlando Towers, Boabab Tree Bar. We have 10 UNESCO World Heritage Sites, such as Mapungubwe and also Robben Island, which is where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. Thank you. Thanks, Gofari. You are awesome. Check out her Instagram and pages in the links in the description below. But yeah, South Africa's natural wonders, you won't even know where to begin with. Like, they have the largest cave system in Africa, the Congo Caves, Borkslax Potholes, the tallest waterfall in Africa, and it just goes on and on. Whoa, whoa. Hold your horses, Catherine. That's the nature stuff. You're going to. F that's. We're gonna talk about that in the next segment. We'll. we'll uh, uh, the next segment, which is. So, South Africa, one word blessed. For one, the country is a low-risk malaria nation, and most areas in the wilderness don't even require medication. They even have their own unique biome called Feinbos, the smallest and the richest of the six floral kingdom in the world, only found in southern Africa with over 6,000 endemic plant species, including the national flower, which is the king protea. Mm. When I think of South Africa, that's what I see in my mind always. Specifically Feinbos. Specifically Feinbos, yes. Mm. It's also home to the rooibos plant, where rooibos tea comes from, and that's my favorite tea. Mm. And rooibos. Yes, it's amazing. Red. Overall, you literally can't find anywhere that looks like South Africa. For one, the country is unlike any other nation in that it's not only the southernmost portion of the East African Rift, but the entire country is kind of split between a semicircle mountain range known as the Great Escarpment. It feeds into the tallest range, the Drakensberg Mountains, in the east where you can find the tallest peak, Mafadi, shared with Lesotho. These mountains are also the source of the longest river in the country, the Orange River, which ends in the Atlantic Ocean. South Africa doesn't have many large natural lakes, and the majority of inland bodies of water are man-made reservoirs, the largest one being the Harip Dam, located in the center of the country. The largest natural freshwater lake, though, is speculated to be Sibai, part of KwaZulu-Natal's Greater St. Lucia Wetland Park on the East Coast, a UNESCO heritage site. If you zoom out a little bit, you'll notice the Great Escarpment has these sharp, narrow, parallel wrinkles at the bottom. These are called the Cape Mountains, which are essentially leftover sediments smashed by contrasting tectonic activity long ago, when South Africa was connected to Argentina and Antarctica in the Gondwana supercontinent. Above these wrinkles, you have the Great Karu Namaka Land, Bushman Land, and Kalamari, which are dry, arid, rocky areas, sparsely populated and loaded with rich flora of succulent plants and minerals. If you move more east and north of the escarpment, you have the eastern midlands, KwaZulu-Natal coast, sweeping up to the Lowveld and the Limpopo Lowveld in the north. These are the most lush and green areas of South Africa and hold much of the arable land as well as nature and forest preserves. When you move inland, though, you get the Highvelds, the Bushveld, and Hrika Land west, which are the arid savannas of South Africa. This is probably one of the most unique areas of South Africa because it is the site where two things happened. One, an enormous meteor hit this spot, creating the largest verified impact crater on Earth known as the Fredford Crater, standing over 300 kilometers wide. You can even see the dome from space at the town of Fredford. And two, said meteor was supposedly the source of many minerals like gold and platinum that fed the land, which later the inhabitants would subsequently discover and go crazy after in a mad gold rush and mining rush. Now, although South Africa is the second largest economy in Africa after Nigeria, it is ranked the most industrialized, technologically advanced, and economically diversified. And although the country does have a wide income gap between the wealthy and poor, the middle class has been growing every year since the 90s. Today, South Africa is one of the world's top platinum and chromium producer. They consistently rank in the top 10 producers of gold and diamonds as well. And finally, the gold rush in Witwatersrand in 1886 pretty much established the country as a mineral powerhouse. Otherwise, only about 5% of the population is formally employed in farming. This means they've shifted much of their economic activity towards other sectors like manufacturing, business, and finance. Today, JSE Limited is the largest stock exchange in Africa, ranking 17th in the world with over trillions of dollars of investment revenue. South Africa also boasts some of the best medical facilities in Africa and has the third largest hospital in the world. Sadly though, South Africa does have the highest population of people infected with HIV at over 7.5 million and fourth in the world per population ratio. There's even a character on their version of Sesame Street who has HIV to help kids born with AIDS to cope. And finally, the country has a huge tourism industry, mostly in the nature areas. Speaking of nature, it's time for Gary Harlow to explain. 
Gary Harlow's Animal Adventure. That's the best I got. South Africa is home to over 20 national parks and dozens of nature reserves. The most famous and visited ones being the Table Mountain National Park and the largest one, Kruger National Park in the Northeast. South Africa is ranked the sixth out of the 17 classified mega diverse countries in the world. 10th for plant species and third for marine endemism. In fact, between May to July, the sardine run happens in which billions of sardines spawn in the cool waters of the Agulhas Bank, creating a feeding frenzy for all the ocean predators. Look at them go! Chomping! Jaws! <laughs> And there's over 850 bird species, including the national bird, the blue crane. But more interesting, South Africa and Namibia are the only two countries in Africa that host penguins. The endangered African or Cape penguin is unique in that it has pink glands above its eyes to help regulate body temperature. Since South Africa is generally much warmer than the typical habitat for penguins like, you know, Antarctica. There's nearly 300 mammal species inhabiting the wilderness including the national animal, the springbok. There's even an entire national park dedicated to elephants in the south. And finally, South Africa is not only home to many animals, but also extinct animal fossils. The Karoo region has more dinosaur fossil sites than any other place in the country, and numerous dinos have been excavated. <coughs> and speaking of dinos, I got a Velosa! Wrap this up! Thank you, Gary. And speaking of wraps, it's time to end off the segment as we always do. Whoa, whoa what's going on? Oh! Food! All right, let's roll. South Africa has so many unique dishes, but one thing is guaranteed, you will see meat on almost every menu. No shocker, they are the largest meat producer in Africa. In any case, here are some of the top dishes you guys suggested. Poppenborst, milk tart, frikadelle, bunny chow, cook sisters, malva pudding, hoiki kos, fat cakes, mopani worms, savory pies, Cape Malay curry, babua tea, biltong. The Western Cape province has some of the most refined wineries in the world, starting all the way back to 1659. And supposedly Route 62 is the longest wine route in the world going over 850 kilometers long. And of course, many might argue the national dish would be braai, or South African style barbecue, cooked over wood flames. Whoa, Noah, you're back. Okay, cool. Thanks, Noah. Oh, uh, and don't forget to get some burgers from Wimpy's and a rib meal from Steers on Wacky Wednesday. Wacky and make Wacky. sure that you go to Spur. Spur has the two for one special on Mondays. <laughs> and speaking of the people of South Africa, uh, I think that means we should probably move on to the next segment. The... Now I asked you guys, the South African geography peeps, what it means to be South African. And here are some things you guys said. Being South African is very nice because we have so many different types of uh, traditional groups where everyone is celebrating. We come from a beautiful country. We're full of cultural diversity. And of course, we truly epitomize the rainbow nation. To be South African means to live in the most beautiful country in the world and to be part of the most vibrant and energetic group of people. We're quite resilient when it comes to the challenges we face as well they have got a strong, strong sense of pride. Living in a post-apartheid era, um, I feel that we have a lot of unity, we have a lot of strength and we are really heroes for the challenges that we face every week and that we overcome and we always find a way to remain in the game and strong. It's an absolute miracle. If you got to see the 2019 Rugby World Cup in Japan and seeing how diverse and incredible uh, South African um, you know, athletes were. It's ever changing, it's always evolving, so many different art movements and interesting things going on. It's an incredible thing. I am especially appreciative of the fact that I don't have to travel far to experience something different. Each of its nine provinces are so unique in their landscapes, in their cultures, in their flavors. So it's that. That's what makes it such a fun and exciting place to be. Thank you guys. What about you, Catherine? Well, I would say that every weekend is a Joel. Joel? What was that? Joel. What is that? So if you're gonna go for a Joel, you're gonna go for a party and it's gonna be like a really insane night. Like you're, if you're gonna go Joel, you're gonna go like really hard that night. Hmm, okay. Now, as you will find out, South Africa is very diverse in terms of ethno-linguistic people groups. Let's start with a pie chart, shall we? The country has about 60 million people and has the largest white and Asian populations and percentages per population in all of Africa. The country is made up predominantly of black Africans at about 80%. However, keep in mind of this 80%, there are many groups. Zulus and Xhosa are the
the largest ones at about 23% and 16%, followed by the Northern Sutu and Tswana at about 9% and 8%, and from there there's a bunch of other groups, but we'll talk about them later in this episode. For the remaining 20% of the population, the white South Africans and coloreds have almost identical populations at somewhere around 9% each. Keep in mind though, amongst the white population, about 60% of them are Afrikaners and 35% are English, the remaining 5 or so percent being other Europeans. The rest of the population is mostly made up of Asians like Indians, Malays, Chinese, and so on. So they use the South African Rand as their currency and they also use the M plug outlet and they also drive on the left side of the road. Left former British colony. Mm -hmm. And also, somewhere around 80% of the country is Christian, mostly adhering to Protestantism. So first off, let's clarify some confusing distinctions. So you heard that word, coloreds. Okay, we Americans might have some horrible pre-civil rights flashbacks when we hear that word, but we assure you, it's totally safe to use here in South Africa, right? Yeah. It is totally <laughs> safe, and I actually did use that word a few times in America, and I didn't know what I was doing until one of my friends that was American, he actually pulled me aside and was like, No. <laughs> now, there's no complete definitive genetic makeup requirement, but color people are essentially people that are mixed mostly between blacks and whites, although you can also have some Asian in there as well. It's not uncommon. Basically, yes. After all the mixing, they kind of just made a new race. Sarah Tishkoff, a geneticist at the University of Pennsylvania, did a genetic study that concluded that the Cape Colors of South Africa have the highest levels of mixed ancestry in the world. So yeah, they're literally the children of the earth. And that other word, Afrikaner, what is that? Well, long story short, they're descended from the people of brought in by the Dutch settlers in the 1600s. Keep in mind though, only about 40% of Afrikaners are directly Dutch descended and the rest were mostly German and French. Dutch and Afrikaans are about 90 to 95% mutually intelligible. South Africa has about 35 indigenous languages, but 11 official languages. Anyway, these 11 languages are divided into five families. And of the languages, English is the preferred language of the intercommunication between all peoples. And most South Africans are fluent in at least two or three languages. You with English and Afrikaans. Right. Yes. Yeah. Is it kind of like really appreciated when a black South African sees a white South African speaking their language? Yeah. Oh, it absolutely is. And that's something that I have not mastered. We are taught Kosa in school, for example. It, it, it isn't to the degree that Afrikaans is, is taught. You don't really become fluent. Like I can understand certain things, but not a lot. Yeah, I think uh, Port Elizabeth was changed to Paipela yes, or something was. like that. Yeah. Exactly. You said that good. <laughs> <laughs> Practicing that was good. Yeah. And yes, many of the Muni languages like Zulu and Kosa have the click sounds. Mm -hmm. These clicks were actually borrowed though. See, of the black Africans, the majority are Bantu. Believe it or not, they are not the original inhabitants of South Africa. Archaeological evidence suggested that they migrated somewhere estimated around the 3rd century AD. The Khoi Khoi and San people, often collectively called the Khoi San, make up less than 1% of the population today, and they are the earliest known inhabitants with ancestors dating back somewhere around 100 to 200,000 years, making them speculated to be some of the oldest peoples on earth. They have the original click languages. Quick history lesson. Over time, the Bantus came in and dominated with their iron tools and farming practices. And although they displaced many of the Khoi San, anthropologists and sociologists speculate that there must have been some intermingling because the click consonants were adopted in their languages. Over a millennium, Later, the Dutch were first Europeans to come in and establish Cape Town and then brought in their farmers known as Boers. Meanwhile, hundreds of miles east, Shaka Zulu was unifying most of the Nguni tribes in the early 19th century and drove out many of the rival tribes like the Matabele, Makololo, and the Fengu. This was known as the Mfetane, or the Great Crushing and Displacement. Enter the British. This is where the story gets really complicated, so here's a quick cutaway to help. I'm taking Cape Town while well, the Netherlands has problems in Europe. Well, I'm just gonna go run away then and make my own republics in the north. Get out! You're not even from this continent! Make me. Oh, I'll make you- Oh, oh. hey! Get the bollocks! There's like a ton of gold and diamonds in your new republic areas. Move over! Hell no! Yeah, there's a lot more that goes into that, but basically it was a chain of weird multi-leveled, multi-party, multi-ethnic battles and subjugation. In addition to the countless native Bantus killed in wars, there were two Boer wars between the British and Afrikaners, which led to 10% of the white Afrikaner population being killed. So you had one European power subjugating another European group on a continent neither were native to, all dealing with the natives. So, in a nutshell, I want the land. I was here centuries before you. I was here over a millennium before you. 
seriously, are we really doing this? In any case, after the country gained independence in 1910 as a union and fully sovereign in 1931, it underwent a controversial period of apartheid or apartheid in 1948 all the way up to 1994. This system essentially divided peoples by racial lines and put strict laws that were obviously racist and not like, you know, equivalent to, you know, certain extreme factions of microaggression culture that blames pretty much everything on racism. I mean, like literally it was actually written, approved, and enacted in legal policy racist. Under the homeland system, most of the black population was concentrated in the ethno states called Bantustans, where only 13% of the land was reserved for the majority of the black populace to have property in. Rules and services were different for colored people as well, like, and the Asian minorities. It was very complicated and often arbitrarily drawn. Some of the colored people were allowed in parliament in the 70s and some weren't. Some minorities were labeled in the same group as coloreds, while some, like the Lebanese, Taiwanese, Koreans, Japanese, they all shared actually the same classification level for whites. It was confusing and weird, yeah. Eventually, after a number of factors pressured them, apartheid ended with full democratization for blacks in 1994, and that's when things got very incredibly tense. See, in Africa, a transition of power like that usually goes one of two ways. One, a spiteful uprising from the native black population built on vengeance that seeks to dispose most of the white population and expropriate everything from them. Or, number two, find a way to move forward as one people with a new system built on forgiveness, acknowledging that it will be awkward and difficult, but peace cannot come from a bitter heart. Today, of course, it's still a very complicated issue and there's no universal narrative and everyone agrees with, and yes, controversial incidents still occur. Crime is still high in certain areas due to social stress and poverty, and yes, there's the whole BEE movement thing which started as a program aimed to integrate the black population into the workforce, but it has a lot of controversial undertones and with implementation. I'm sure you could probably say a lot of stuff about that, yes. you and the other South Africans. Then there's the energy crisis or load shedding issue. You'll actually wake up in the morning and you'll get a message on your phone because we have an app that will tell you it's from 6 a.m. to maybe like 2 p.m. You won't have any energy at all. At least they have an app that warns you, so. That's new, that's new. We didn't always have that. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. very recent. They're working on it. <laughs> yes. But the point is there's so much stuff. If you guys want to write about it in the comments, if you're from South Africa, I implore you to have a civil discussion, which I know on YouTube is almost impossible, but. I don't know, watch the movie Invictus if you want to get an idea on how it started. Oh, and uh, speaking of Invictus, let's move on to a lighter note. Let's talk about the sports. Here's Art with the sports part. Hey guys, whoa, sh hey guys. <laughs> hey guys, it's me and Tarchin, we're back. All right, I gotta put Tarchin down so we can start. Specifically rugby. Their national team, the Springboks, have won the World Cup three times, tied with New Zealand. In fact, South Africa is one of only two countries that has hosted the soccer, rugby, and cricket World Cups. In fact, they are actually the only African country to host the soccer World Cup so far. Fun fact, South Africans are actually one of the only countries that, like us Americans, also call football Soccer. Cheers to you guys. Soccer! Makes no sense, but we're together in our wrongness. Otherwise, cricket is probably the third most popular sport, and their national team, the Proteus, usually ranks in the world's top 10 best teams. Otherwise, at the Olympics, they've done pretty well in the swimming and athletics department, racking up 26 gold medals so far. Gold is better than silver. They've also been tennis powerhouses as well. Johan Creek won two Australian Grand Slam titles in the 80s. That's a big deal. In certain areas, you might find a touch of Dutch with things like corf ball. Also originating in South Africa is ring ball, which is basically another variation of corf ball. <laughs> Yukske is a traditional Afrikaner sport similar to horseshoes in which you have to knock over a peg on the ground from a distance. And many of the native peoples have their own style of martial arts. The most renowned probably being the Nuni stick fighting or Donga, performed mostly by the Zulu or the Alt. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> that was horrible. Oh, that people. That was better, yeah. Okay. And that's it for me. I'm gonna get the out of here. I'll see ya. Thank you, Art. And South Africa is also really well known for its surfing. And if you ever just want to watch a competition and have a great Joel, you can go Joel. to J-Bay. Yes, exactly. There's That's that what it would happen. So as we mentioned, South Africa has a huge diversity of ethno-linguistic people groups. We already made a video explaining about some of them, but let's just quickly cover the main ones. First, you have the Nguni group. This group includes the cousins Zulus, Osas, and the Ndebele peoples. Zulus are probably the most well-known worldwide. You may have seen images of their traditional animal skin warrior attire or weaponry and dance ceremonies for the 
women. Women often wear those wide conical isicholo hats on special occasions. For the Xhosa, they are kind of like the pacifist siblings of the Zulus. Their traditional garbs have those black and white patterns with beads and red ochre dyed blanket coverings. Indebele are like the artists, known for their colorful patterns, painted houses, the symbols are unique to each family. And they are also the bead experts and they'll flaunt heavy beaded neck and leg ornaments on special occasions. Finally, the Swazi people basic are basically cousins to the people of the Eswatini, known for honoring their kings with Mklanga or reed dance. Then we have the Sutu group, made up of the Sutu, the Tswana, and the Sepedi peoples. They're all rel relatives to the people of Lesotho and Botswana, and many of them are mountain people. You can see lots of them riding horses and wearing Makarotlo hats and Basutu blankets as temperatures are generally colder with high elevations. The Swana people have eight major clans and they love the color blue, especially with the Letishi cloth. The Songa are known for their many, many initiation rituals and electric dance style or Songa disco. The Venda people are some of the most isolated groups in the north, famous for their natural medicines, and the Masangwe or bare knuckle fist fight sport, which people People use to kind of like monitor and solve disputes. Now for non-Africans, we already explained about the white South Africans. The Afrikaners and the English are unique in the way that they kind of develop their own breakaway Africanized culture from the European ancestors. What are you by the way? I'm English. Oh okay. I'm <laughs> an English through and through. The colored community has always kind of had a unique status as the somewhat marginalized but not as marginalized group. They've always kind of had to figure out who they were since they technically didn't fully belong anywhere. It's yeah. Then you have the Asian community. The largest group being of the Cape Malays and the Indians, brought over during colonial times for their indentured servitude. The Burkhard neighborhood of Cape Town is essentially the Malay quarter, and today their culture is a fascinating mixture that blends elements of Dutch and Asian. In fact, most of them actually speak Afrikaans as their first language, and the Malay language is almost all but gone. The Indian community was brought in by the British, and Durban has one of the highest population of Indians outside of India. Most were brought over from West and South India, including Gandhi, who spent 21 years living in the area. Whew, yeah, that was a lot, and that wasn't even scratching the surface. There's so many other people groups we didn't even talk about. But in any case, here's Hannah to explain a little bit more about the few things that South Africa's people have collectively as one entity, one entity, eternity. <laughs> you get the point. Hannah's culture segment. Random Hannah. Woo! South Africa! Guys, get a random Hannah shirt at geographynow.com. So, all right, obviously there is no such thing as a single type of South African, but in the end, they are still one country that moves forward to the best of their ability. For one, many of the native ethnic groups, whether Zulu or Venda, follow the Labola system, in which the groom must pay a dowry in cattle to the bride's family. I love the countries where they pay people with cattle. Remember Rwanda? <laughs> yes, I freaked out. I was like, what? There is literally a Labolo app available now to help relieve the stress of figuring how many cattle you owe. Township art became very popular in the 60s and 70s. It was sort of a social commentary movement that depicted the impoverished black communities as South Africa to move towards the end of apartheid. In addition, you will notice there are so many different architecture styles in South Africa. You have everything from the massive thatched fortified dome huts of Zulu to the Cape Dutch style homes inspired from the Dutch with flat crow stepped gable roof. South Africans have also been front runners in many inventions, discoveries, and innovations. For example, the automatic pool cleaner, the CAT scan, putty adhesive, the smart lock safety syringe, the world's first heart transplant happened here, the yellow fever vaccine, and they have the biggest optical telescope in the southern hemisphere, and so on. What else? Fun fact, being South African means knowing the difference between now, now now, and just now. Ah uh, yes, thank you Jay. South Africa has also been the location shot of many feature films and TV shows. Everything from the debuting film The Gods Must Be Crazy, Academy Award winner Sotsi, which I actually watched last night. Amazing movie. Academy Award nominated District 9 and Chappie. And of course, Mandela Long Walk to Freedom. What's your takeaway from South African cinema? There's some amazing comedy, which I feel like people don't talk about that much. I've been watching a lot of Leon Schuster movies. Yeah. And finally, the one thing that unifies all South Africans is Heritage Day, in which people are encouraged to wear their traditional costumes and express their background. And everyone joins in a bride together, no matter who you are. Usually the festivals include an abundance of music. So to expound more on that, here's Keith. Blah, blah, blah. Wait, Keith isn't here. How's he going to be in this video? Hannah, I'm in
in Florida. And guess what? You can't cancel me. Anyways, South Africa. They have so much going on. Even their national anthem is sung in five different languages. Basically from the beginning, traditional vocals were used along with the marimba, the uhadi, the kora, and other assorted hand drums and harps. The first style of music to really take over the world, probably Marabi. Now Marabi started out in the slums of Johannesburg and Marabi is a style of music that is basically underground swing jazz. From there, world-renowned artists such as Soweto Gospel Choir and Lady Smith Black Mombazo have put South Africa on the map. Every South African will definitely know Johnny Clegg, the white Zulu who wrote songs in Zulu to criticize apartheid. Today, South Africa is known predominantly for its popularity in house music, and more specifically for the subgenres of Wham and I'm a piano. I'm I'm a piano. You guys told us to definitely mention those styles of music. Some other South African artists that you may be familiar with are Diane Wood for their crazy hip hop South African -y fusion style of music. You guys might know Synth Peter, who I think has one of the greatest songs ever written. It's called Doof Doof. You shall it all go jam to Doof Doof. Yeah. Yeah, that's it for me. Hope you guys had a good one, and back to you, Paul! Thank you, Keith. All right, so this is the part where we talk about some of the famous people of South Africa, and here's South African geography, Kolo, to explain. South Africa is as talented as it is diverse. A few notable South Africans that you geography peeps might be familiar with include Charlize Theron, John Carney, Trevor Noah, Shoto Copley, Gugu Mbata Ro, Demi Lee Peters, Zozi Binzi Tunzi, and last but not least, business magnate Elon Musk. There are a number of South Africans who have excelled in different fields across the decades. These are but just a few South Africans that you geography peeps might be familiar with. Thank you, Kolo. All right, and with that, we got to move on to the next segment. Uh, this video is getting kind of long. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you ready? Yeah. All right, let's talk about the friends of South Africa. <laughs> All right, so South Africa and their clique, who's in and who's close? Well, it really depends on where you want to start on the globe, but put in a nutshell. As a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, of course, South Africa has always had many ties to their Anglophone counterparts. New Zealand and Australia are kind of like the Southern Hemisphere trio that dominate the Tropic of Capricorn. These three have been trading and assisting each other for centuries and have friendly competitions. There was a bit of tension in the past, though, since many white South Africans choose to move to these countries in fear of policies they think might target them in South Africa. It got to the point where an Australian cabinet member even referred to them as refugees, which caused some backlash. But apart from that, overall, these three get along great. South Africa is also a member of the BRICS nations, the Association of Emerging Economies being Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Together, these five have about a quarter of the world's land and about 40% of the world's population. They maintain a non-interference policy with mutual benefit plans. As a former British and Dutch colony, obviously the UK and Netherlands have cordial ties. Many South Africans visit or live in these countries. Interestingly, though, despite a heavy usage of the Afrikaans language, South Africa has rejected all offers to join the Dutch language union and today stands in special partner status along with Indonesia. If you ask who South Africa's best friends are though, you'd probably have to head a little closer home. Today, despite being fully independent sovereign nations, South Africans usually don't even see Lesotho or Eswatini as separate countries. South Africa even has more Sotho and Swazi people than the entire population of each country. Same goes for the Swana people of Botswana. So they get these countries. In addition, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Namibia are are also in the core group. They share a lot of the same ethnic groups like the Shona, Tsonga, and Khoisan. Granted, yes, there was a little bit of tension with Zimbabwe when they called for economic sanctions against South Africa during apartheid, and South Africa was pissed that Zimbabwe was hosting guerrilla rebels, and they didn't really like Zimbabwe's expropriation laws that kind of kicked out almost their entire white population, but nonetheless, they have good relations. As for Namibia, they actually were a part of South Africa until gaining independence in 1990, so there's a significant historical tie. Today, a huge portion of Namibia's economy is tied with South Africa, they even accept the South African Rand as legal tender. And overall, they just really like each other when they meet up. In conclusion, I think uh, you should take it away. Catherine, I'm out. So South Africa, I feel, is super unique in the way that we connect with one another. The words that we use, the lingo, just everything is very different to anything I've ever experienced in, in another country. I feel like South Africa is just like Fembos in the way that it's not seen anywhere else in the world. I like that. It's like Fembos. Nowhere else on earth. And stay tuned. Spain is coming up next.